Okay, let's get started. So, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to the Control Miss Learning Seminar. Today, we are delighted to have Professor Dorsa Sudi from Stanford University. Professor Dorsa Sudi is an assistant professor in the computer science and electrical engineering at Stanford. Her research interests lie in the intersection of robotics, learning, and control theory. Specifically, she is interested in developing algorithms for safe and adaptive human-robot interactions. Dorsa have received her PhD in ECS from Berkeley in 2017 and received her bachelor degree in ECS from Berkeley in 2012. So she has received numerous awards for her research, including the NSF Career Award, the Young Investigator Award from the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, and the IEEE TCCPS Early Career Award, the Google Faculty Award, and the Amazon Faculty Research Award. So today she will talk about some interesting works in human-robot interaction. Dorset, the floor is yours. All right, thank you so much. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for inviting me. I'm super excited to be here. Yeah, so let me start sharing my screen. Uh, okay, can you guys see it? Yes, thumbs up. Yes. Okay, perfect. So uh, I'm probably not gonna be watching out for chat, but um, this is like, I think a good group, it's a good size group. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to just jump in and stop me and, and we can just talk about it. Uh, but yeah, so let's just get into it. So today what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the work that we have been doing over the past year, kind of in the space of um, understanding interactions a little bit better. And when I say interactions, this is interactions with mul between multiple agents or between humans and robots, or you could even think about it as interactions between humans and AI agents. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what are the type of tools and techniques we use from learning and control and what sort of insights we can get from learning and control to address some of these interaction questions. And then further, like what can interaction give us to better do learning and control? So, so how these two are, are kind of like informing each other. Um, and yeah, as, um, as mentioned, my research is in the space of human-robot interaction and the type of human-robot interactions we look at are kind of like uh, these types of dyadic interactions or teleoperations. And I'll talk about that later when we get to it throughout the talk. Okay, so let's just get into it. So when we think about when we think about the field of robotics, right? The field of robotics has seen a lot of advances over, over the past decade. And, and a lot of these advances are due to having really awesome controllers, right? Like we have like all these, like we have Boston Dynamic demos every six months doing really amazing things. And, and a lot of it is really due to like having very good controllers. And then on the other hand, we also have really good learning algorithms that can help us do better, better robotics and in general, like better learning in, in this space. So the robot on the right is OpenAI's arm that's a hand that's trying to do uh, this dexterous manipulation of moving the block from one configuration to another configuration. And they're using a lot of ideas from reinforcement learning, which is really cool. So lots of advances. Robotics, robotics is hot these days, right? Like people are working on it. Very exciting. But the type of thing we haven't really seen yet is, is having these robots seamlessly interacting with each other. And if you think about it, finally, we have got to a point where robots are so good that we can start, robots are okay, but we can start thinking about some of these challenging problems of robots actually interacting with people in, in kind of like short-term interactions, like one-step interactions, as well as like repeated long-term interactions, which I think is something that is a little bit underlooked and we should think about it a little bit more carefully as you're putting, let's say, autonomous cars on our roads that need to interact with us over long periods of times, or as we put robots in our homes for assistive settings or for service settings. I think all of these are examples that, that require seamless interaction and not just one step interaction, right? Actually like long-term repeated interaction. Um, and I think a lot of effort goes into building robots that are really good and do the job and not as much into thinking about interaction. So my talk today is going to be focused on that and trying to understand some of the challenges around that problem. 
And to do that, let's try to get some insights from how humans interact with each other, right? Like one thing we might think about here is in, in this space is how is it that two humans can come in together and so easily collaborate and coordinate with each other, do kind of like complex manipulation tasks and even influence each other at times. And I think that is very interesting. And, and there is quite a bit of work on trying to understand how people coordinate and collaborate with each other. And one common paradigm here is to assume that two humans come together trying to do a task. Let's say they're trying to play a game of chess. And one way of modeling that this interaction, one way of thinking about this interaction is to say, well, each one of these agents is going to have some sort of model of the other agent. Uh, and, and it's going to have that model. And based on that model, it's going to kind of proceed in, the, in this game of chess. Okay. And, and this is often referred to as theory of mind, and it has like its own name in, in every field, right? In human robot interaction, we often call this theory of mind, which is me thinking about what you are thinking about. And I could even like go further down that loop, right? Like me thinking about you thinking about me thinking about and so on. And this kind of creates a game theoretic type of, type of interaction. Uh, and you could try to basically solve this game and try to figure out how to play a game of chess or how to coordinate with a person maybe, or how to compete with a person in a game of chess. But this type of idea of theory of mind modeling or this game theoretic modeling of interaction um, is, is, although it is successful, it also has a set of challenges. And, and although this is like a common paradigm that we use in human robot interaction, I think, it would be interesting to think about the fact that, think about and ask this question of can we do better than that and what are some of the challenges in this space? I don't want to, so, so I want to emphasize that this is a cool like paradigm. We have used this paradigm in our prior work. So um, actually as part of my PhD work, I was looking at how an autonomous car interacts with a human driven car. And we actually modeled that interaction in a game theoretic fashion, like kind of like this theory of mind modeling. And, and we ended up seeing really like interesting behaviors from that, right? Like we ended up seeing like cars kind of nudging in in front of other vehicles and making them slow down, which is, which is an interesting behavior that you wouldn't get if you don't think about the interaction in this particular way, or if you don't think about the interaction period, right? So, so why were we able to see this type of behavior? Because the way we modeled the interaction was to think about how like we have an autonomous car, let's say the orange car, and assume that the orange car is optimizing some sort of objective. And, and we assume that this objective is a function of states and actions of the vehicle, which is normal and usual. But, but the idea here is to model the interaction, I should think about how the autonomous car is influencing the human driven car. And I'm gonna use UHS star here to refer to like the actions of the human. And a very good question to ask is, well, what does the human do? And uh, actually a big thread of like my work these days is focused on what does the human do? But in this case, like we model the, the human as an agent who is approximately optimizing their own reward function. So we use ideas from imitation learning and specifically inverse reinforcement learning to model how humans act in this space. But once we have these models, right? Like we, we, we thought about this interaction in this dynamical systems fashion in kind of like an underactuated dynamical systems fashion where we thought about how the actions of the vehicle influences the actions of the human. And, and we took that into account in, in this model. But as I was complaining about theory of mind, right? Like this, this idea of theory of mind does not really scale up. Right, like if, if I want to solve that full game, that's not going to really work out, right? Like in real time on this vehicle, thinking about what the human thinks about me, thinking about the human. We have like that infinite regress here, which is which is not which is not very practical. So every single field that uses theory of mind, including human robot interaction, including control game theory, like what 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 they do is they try to come up with a set of approximations for it, right? So, so one common approximation here is to say, well, instead of solving the full game, let's try to cut the game at the first time step. And let's just approximate it using stack celebrate games or leader follower games, where I assume the actions of the robot car, the autonomous car influences the human, but the actions of the human is not influencing the robot car. The, the human is just observing the robot car. And the reason, again, that worked out okay in our case was we actually were solving this in an MPC fashion and we were replanning at every horizon. So, so that this approximation didn't really like hurt us that much. Okay. So, so that's all great. Going back to my game of chess, right? You can, you can model the interaction. You can model it using this game theoretic fashion. 
But the thing I'd like to argue is that this theory of mind modeling and then approximating it, although it works in some settings, like playing a game of chess, it's not necessarily the best paradigm when we think about interactions and when we think about interactions of other types that are not like playing chess. And, and specifically, I'd like to argue that a lot of tasks, actually most interactive tasks, are not the same as playing chess. And, and let's look at an example for that. So, so imagine I have two people, Alex and Bob, coming together, trying to, trying to build a structure together. Okay? So, so in this case, I, I really don't think Alex is here thinking, well, I wonder what Bob's belief over my policy in the next time step is. Like humans are amazing at doing this. They can seamlessly come together and achieve this task. But I don't think for some of these types of tasks, they're doing theory of mind modeling over policies. I don't think they're doing recursive belief modeling. And the reason I don't think that is that one thing we know about humans is that they're bounded rational. They have like bounded memory and bounded resources. And because they are bounded rational, like they're not gonna be able to keep track of these high dimensional beliefs of what the other agent is trying to do. So instead, like how is it that they're so good at doing these tasks? I think what they're doing in this case is that they're trying to keep track of a lower dimensional representation that is sufficient for capturing the task. And I find that very interesting, right? Like what humans are doing in this setting is they're trying to like quickly figure out what is that representation? What is that core representation that captures a full thing? And they, keep try, and they try to keep track of that basically. And that representation, we often have names for it, right? Like we call it the intent of the human or maybe the role of the human or in the driving case, we might call it the driving style of the human. And, and at this point you might say, okay, so what is the big deal, right? There is like a lot of work that tries to do belief modeling over intents or over like driving styles, right? Like what am I trying to like argue here? Why am I making a big deal out of this? So, so the reason I'm making a big deal out of this is I'm not suggesting, let's say we have five intents and then like have a palm DP formulation and do belief modeling over those five intents. What I'm suggesting is I don't even know like what that representation is or what that intent is, whatever we wanna call it. I'm trying to directly find that representation from interaction data of these two agents coordinating with each other. Because again, like humans know that, like humans don't come into this task saying there are three intents and I, I wanna figure out like what the policies of the other agent is on, on over those intents, okay? And, and this is kind of similar to the idea of sufficient statistics. So there is actually quite a bit of work in the space of multi-agent control and thinking about sufficient statistics in multi-agent control. And you can think about this representation as an approximation of that, of that sufficient statistic that is required for doing this task. Okay, so, so the thing that I'm arguing in this talk, and I'm gonna use this idea throughout, is the fact that I think in a lot of interactive tasks, there is a low dimensional representation that captures the interaction. And that low dimensional representation can actually change over time. So when we think about repeated interactions, we can think about the fact that that low dimensional representation is changing over time. And I would argue that this type of, this type of framework, it, it's an orthogonal paradigm to theory of mind. It's not exactly doing theory of mind, it's doing another approximation of the interaction based on representation learning over, over the po policy of the other agents. That, that is kind of like the core idea here. All right, so keeping that in mind, today what I wanna do is I wanna talk about a few different projects around this idea. And this idea of representations kind of like shows up throughout. And, and my idea, like ideally my goal here is to think about human robot, humans and robots interacting with each other in a similar fashion that Alex and Bob are interacting with each other in this case. And, and one thing that I think is important, one characteristic that I think it's important to keep track of is that when, when Alex is interacting with Bob, Bob is changing, right? Like Bob doesn't follow a fixed policy, right? Like Bob is becoming better at this task every day. So, so we need to be able to capture non-stationarities of the other agent. The fact that the human in this case is actually changing, it's not following a fixed policy. And, and I think that's an, an important problem and challenge when it comes to interactions. It's an important problem generally in reinforcement learning too, right? Like if you're doing reinforcement learning in non-stationary environments, you kind of fall into the same sort of situation, same sort of challenges. The second thing I'd like to do is I'd like to be able to have a robot that can actually coordinate with the person once, once we thought about this interaction. And then even go maybe beyond coordination, ideally I would wanna be able to take actions 
that are influencing. So if you remember the car example that I gave, I, I told you guys like when you can think about that game theoretic interaction and the nice thing that comes out of it is that my autonomous car ends up nudging in in front of a human driven car. And that influences the human to slow down, right? Does this vehicle, if it was going like 60 miles per hour, it's not gonna keep going 60 miles per hour. It's actually going to like slow down. And that is the result of being influenced. And once we think about this idea of partner modeling and, and the robots coordinating with humans, I think it's important to think about influencing as well. So how can we influence and uh, what would be the impacts of that again, over short-term as well as over long-term interactions. And, and finally, like I'm gonna use this idea of representations and, and trying to capture that low dimensional representation as a way of attempting this issue of non-stationarity and this issue of influence. Okay, so my plan is to talk about a project where we are thinking about this idea of learning representations that capture the intent of the other agent and think about non-stationarity and influencing from that perspective. I know I only have 50 minutes, so I'm probably going to very briefly mention the last two topics, but, but let me spend some time on the, on the first idea, which kind of captures all these characteristics that I'd like to emphasize on. Okay, so going back to this picture, right? Like when we think about interaction, other agents, uh, humans or robots when you're interacting with them, they're often non-stationary as I was arguing earlier. And that, what that means is they tend to update their behavior in response to the robot, right? Like their, their, their reward function, their policies actually change in response to the robot. And we try to think about this interaction um, in, in, in an example. So let me give you an example. So imagine we have two robots that are trying to play a game of air hockey with each other. And then I have a robot that's my learning agent that's trying to figure out what to do. I'm gonna call that ego agent. And then at the same time, I have another agent. I'm gonna call that an other agent. The reason I'm calling it other agent is this paradigm works in both competitive or cooperative settings. So I don't wanna call it opponent or partner because, because it could be just this other agent. And, and the idea here is that the other agent, let's say it has some fixed hand-coded policy. So that fixed hand-coded policy basically pushes the puck either to the right or left or this, to the center, okay? So then a trajectory that the, uh, the ego agent observes is going to be a sequence of state and actions and rewards, and rewards are going to be defined based on the distance to the puck, and if you actually block the puck, you're going to get some rewards for that, okay? So then this, this other agent is going to follow the, the strategy, as I mentioned, right? And the strategy is going to be represented by, by, by Z, and it depends on the previous trajectory and what it has done previously. So, so the way we are encoding the other agent's policy is if it pushes the puck and the ego agent blocks it, it's going to change its policy to something else. It's, it's a very simple hand-coded policy, but let's just start with that very simple hand-coded policy, okay? So, our core idea here is you want to learn that representation that captures the interaction here. And the way we do that is by using dimensionality reduction techniques. Specifically, what we are doing is we're looking at a trajectory, a, a, sequence of, a sequence of state actions rewards from the previous time step. And we're trying to encode that into a low dimensional representation Z. And the way we train this Z is, is to, to ensure that Z is enough for decoding the next interaction. And, and Z is basically capturing what ego agent thinks the other agent is going to do, kind of like a low dimensional latent representation of the other agent's policy. I'm gonna call this latent intent or latent strategy. And then here, like the way we train this autoencoder in this case is it's, it doesn't have like a, it, it actually has like a prediction loss. So we are looking at the past trajectory and we are trying to predict the next trajectory, and that is how we are, we are trying to capture, capture this ZK, which is this low dimensional representation here, okay? All right, so once I have that representation, right, like once I capture that representation, what I can do is I can actually use that representation for, for planning and, and control for my, for my other agent, right? Like now that I have ZK, I can take that ZK and do anything with it, right? I can plan with it because now that ZK is capturing how, how the other agent is, is operating in this space. And specifically what we are looking at here is kind of like a reinforcement learning paradigm where we are maximizing the expected return, but the expected return here also depends on the latent strategy of the other agent. And, and this expectation is over, over the policies that again are conditioned on how the other agent is going to operate. And that's the Z that we're actually learning through the representation learning. 
So if, max, if we maximize the expected return within an interaction, we're going to be able to react to the other agents. And then we're calling this, this algorithm learning and influencing latent intent or Lily. And, and um, kind of, I want to emphasize one other point here, which is that the loop, the learning loop, loop for reinforcement learning and representation learning are actually connected, right? Like once we do reinforcement learning and to figure out a policy for the, for the ego agent that generates new trajectories and with those new trajectories, we're going to learn a new representation and then kind of like feed that back in and continue. Okay. All right, so let me show you how this works in a very simple example. So, so this is a point mass example, it's, a, it's an abstract example. And here um, we have basically like two point mass agents. So I have an ego agent and an other agent. And my ego agent starts somewhere inside of the circle. Let's say it starts here at time t1. And then it's moving towards the circle, towards, towards the boundaries of the circle. And I have this other agent and the other agent is the gray agent. And what the other agent can do is it can move either clockwise or counterclockwise. Okay. And then the way this dynamics works is, is we, are, we are kind of like formulating this example so that if the ego agent ends up inside of the circle at the very end, the, the other agent moves counterclockwise. But then if the ego agent ends up outside of the circle, the, the other agent moves clockwise. So, so in some sense, like our actions, the actions of the robot that we are, we, are, we are planning for, the ego agent is influencing the actions of the other agent, right? Like it's actually like changing the, the, the dynamics of how the other agent is going to respond. And what is the goal? The objective here is for the ego agent to go ahead and capture the other agent as fast as possible. Okay, so, so it's kind of like a capturing type of, type of objective. All right, so that's just a setup. So, what happens is that if you train kind of state of the art reinforcement learning, like soft actor critic in this case, what ends up happening is that the ego agent starts somewhere inside of the circle. And, and the best strategy that it can come up with is to just go in the middle of the circle because it's not like really modeling the other agents, right? So, so it's not capturing a model of the other agent. And because of that, the best thing it can do is it can just like go in the middle of the circle because that's like the best strategy. Uh, in, in the case that the other agent moves clockwise or counterclockwise, that is like literally the best thing you can do. If you're using our algorithm, Lily, what happens is that the other agent, uh, so the ego agent is going to capture this latent intent of the other agent. So, so it has that model. And because it has that model, it's able to like go ahead and actually capture the other agent like accurately on the, on the surface of, of this circle. And, and that's kind of exciting, right? Like the fact that I was able to like go and capture this and, and model that again, I'm not modeling it using let's say belief modeling in, like as you do in theory of mind, I'm modeling this using this representation that, that captures what the other agent is trying to do. And in this case, it's <laughs> very simple case. Um, and it's very simple case. Uh, what that latent representation should capture really is if the other agent is moving clockwise or counterclockwise on, on, this, on this circle. Like that is the thing that it's going to capture. All right, so let's look at this in practice. So we, you, so, so we define the reward function in this, in this setting. So if the ego agent blocks the puck, it gets a reward of plus one. We also um, kind of synthetically made the example to, to be if the ego agent blocks the puck on the left, it gets more reward. So, so we kind of like designed the reward in a way that the ego agent really likes to block the puck on the left and maybe it gets more rewards if it goes to the left, okay? All right, so um, using this setup, what ends up happening is uh, if you train soft actor critic after two hours of training, it's able to like only go to one side, it always goes to the right. And it's like, it thinks that, okay, so it can block the puck like eventually, but only on one side because it doesn't model the other agent. And then after four hours of training, it realizes that, oh, blocking the puck on the left is better because uh, on the left, I get more reward. So it always goes to the left and sometimes it's able to block the puck. And, and here is actually like the success plot. So here, Y axis is success. And what that means is um, like we, the, with soft actor critic, we're going to basically start blocking uh, the puck on the right. At some point we realize, well, going to the left is better. So, so we go back to learning that go, like if we always go to the left, we're, we are able to block the puck sometimes like around 40% of the times. Um, and that's the strategy that comes out of reinforcement learning. Okay. Using Lily, what, we, what ends up happening is after four hours of training, 
uh, the robot is able to basically predict where the puck is going to end up at. And then based on that, it's able to like block the puck. Um, and and six, like around the success rate is around 90%. So around 90%, it's able to block the puck, which is kind of exciting. Okay. All right. So, so that was that was Lily, right? Like we had reinforcement learning and this idea of dimensionality reduction to capture the other agents' policies kind of combined together. And that allows us to react to other to other agents, right? Coordinate with other agents, which is kind of exciting. But the thing is, we could actually do better than that. And by that, what I mean is, like if, if you think about this, what we are doing right now is you're maximizing expected return over one interaction, but instead of doing that, we can maximize expected return across multiple interactions. And if we optimize expected return across multiple interactions, kind of like thinking about it as a long-term reward type of a problem, we are, we are able to go beyond reacting and we're actually able to influence the other agent. And, and that's like where the influencing part comes in. So, so what do I mean by that? So going back to this point mass example, if you remember like using Lily without influencing, we were able to actually like go ahead and capture the, 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 the other agent, which was fine, but this wasn't the best strategy because at the end of the day, I wanna be able to capture the puck as quickly as possible. So the best strategy for me is to influence the agent to end up around here so that I can capture it like very quickly because I, I will travel like I will travel less if, if I get the other agent end up here. And that's actually like what Lily with influencing does. So, so if you actually optimize the reward across multiple interactions, we are able to influence the other agent to, to act in a way that we like as the ego agent. And what that means is we're able to capture the puck and also get the puck like close to us, which is, which is interesting. So what would that mean in this case, in the case of um, the um, air hockey example? So what that means in the case of air hockey example is, remember I was getting more rewards if I would go to the left, right? Cause that was, that was like a reward of plus two as opposed to a reward of plus one. And what ends up happening is that, is that we are able to, in this case, influence the other agent to push the puck more to the left so I can block it more there and I can get more rewards. So if you think about this in terms of success rate, in terms of success rate, nothing changes that much, right? Like we are still like have that capability of blocking the puck no matter where it is pushed. And then it's like around 90% again. Uh, but in terms of where the puck is pushed, in the case of influencing, you're able to like get the other agents, like push the puck more often to the left, right? Which is kind of like what, what would be the thing we would want because we get more rewards there. So 41% so of the times it goes to the left as opposed to the no influencing case where it's kind of like uniform between right, left and middle. And, and one thing to note here is sure, learning takes a little bit longer. Like right, if you look at the, the uh, Lily with influencing versus without influencing, it does take a little bit longer, but eventually it does get to that 90%, 90% um, success rate. Okay. All right, so what have I been talking about so far? So I've been talking about this, this, this idea that when we are thinking about human partners or other agents, they're often non-stationary. And this non-stationarity can be represented using low dimensional latent strategies, again, as opposed to me doing like recursive belief modeling over what they're doing. So, so we are trying to capture this non-stationarity by modeling that using a low dimensional latent strategy. And then once we have that latent strategy, then we can actually react to the other agent or we could influence that latent strategy, right? Like we could influence how the other agent is going to act in this space. And Lily basically anticipates the partner's policies using the latent strategies and influences and reacts to them, which is, which is all like nice and cool. But remember, like we were motivated by this project because we wanted to work with humans, right? Like we were talking about the fact that human partners are non-stationary, not robot partners. And everything I've shown to you like so far is, is about like robots and robots coordinating with each other. And we actually did try out Lily with human partners. We didn't train it with human partners. We, we did basically like try it out with human partners. And we had around like 70% success rate where we tell the human to follow a specific policy and so on. But human, human policies tend to be a lot noisier and, and, and that can also make the problem a lot more difficult. And if you wanna learn actually like the human's policy, as opposed to this hand-coded policy that we tell humans to follow, then we actually need 
to, to train with the human in the loop. And that's not very, that's not very efficient. That, that, that's, that's not gonna work. That's not very practical, right? Because the, the videos I showed earlier of the two robots doing these tasks, they were, they were training overnight pretty much, right? Like, like those videos were training after four hours and, and I cannot have a human in the loop of this reinforcement learning, deep reinforcement learning process and try to learn with, with that. And, and that's kind of unfortunate. And, and like that brings us to this question of how can we learn from humans in the loop? Or is that like completely impractical? Should we like not even try to learn from humans? Like, or, and, and if you're not learning from humans, how are we ever going to like figure out what humans non-stationarities are and what humans like and intents are? And, and I think that's a difficult question. It's an important research question. And I'm gonna give some ideas of how we have been trying to approach this problem. So going back to my, to my outline, right? So I've been basically talking about this idea of learning evolving interactions using latent representations. And that is able to capture non-stationarity of the other agent that's able to coordinate, even influence the other agent in, in the settings we have seen. And then we have been using this idea of latent representations, latent intent in this case. But the thing it doesn't really capture is learning from humans, right? Like I wanted to learn from humans. I've been talking about interactions with humans. And, and for that, um, I, want to, I want to talk a little bit about what are some approaches we have been taking that is trying to learn directly from humans to, to figure out how to do tasks for robots. Um, and, and that kind of falls into this more general category of learning reward functions and, and learning policies from humans. And for that, I'm going to simplify everything. So, so I'm going to try to learn from humans. But uh, I'm not going to worry about non-stationarity. So I'm going to just try to learn a single reward function that is a fixed reward function. And I'm not going to worry about the fact that the human changes over time. And I'm not even like worrying about what the robot would do. Let's just try to figure out what the human does or wants. Um, and then I'm even not going to talk about the latent representation. So, so specifically, the, the, the topic that I want to very briefly maybe talk about in the next 10 minutes is, is this idea of learning from Human, human feedback or data collected from humans, right? And when we think about the field of robotics, right? This is, um, this is an idea that has been around for a long period of time, right? The fact that I can have a human show a robot how to pick up an object. And from that data, from that demonstration, the robot should try to figure out more generally how to pick up cups. Right. This idea of learning from demonstrations has been around for 20 years at least, right? In AI machine learning robotics and even like longer, like dating back to like Kalman thinking about like inverse optimal control and then trying to figure out what, it, what is a cost function and what is a reward function from, from demonstrations. And I think it's, it's a very uh, interesting idea, but it's kind of like a limiting way of thinking about the problem. And the reason I think it's a limiting way of thinking about the problem is um, in general, like teleoperating these robots that have high degrees of freedom tend to be really challenging. And, and it's a very li data limited regime, right? Like we don't have humans, like we don't have like lots of data of humans like doing this. And, and if we can't, right? Like we are not gonna see the same sort of advances that fields like NLP or vision have seen when they're using learning, right? Like, because we just, we just don't have the same level of data. So the idea that we have been exploring is that demonstrations, expert demonstrations is only one source of data that is available here. And in general, there are many other sources of data that we can tap into when we think about interacting with humans. Humans are leaking information like all the time. And, and we should try to like figure out what those information are, or we should try to actively like ask them like questions that are actually informative in order to figure out what those reward functions or what those policies are. Okay. So for that, like um, very big picture generally, like this idea of expert demonstrations has been around. Some other ideas that we have been exploring in the lab is trying to learn from non-expert demonstrations, right? Like we have a lot of suboptimal demonstrations or observations or a lot of like YouTube videos of people cooking. If we can tap into that, right? Like that would be really nice if we can, uh, or if we can fall into, like if, if we can learn from suboptimal demonstrations, that would be really nice too. Cause like um, expert demonstrations can be very limiting. And in general, when we collect data, a lot of times those behaviors that are coming from humans tend to be suboptimal, but they're still like useful, we can still learn from them. So we have actually a recent work around this uh, idea of learning from suboptimal demonstrations that I'm not covering in this talk. I, I wanna just very briefly talk about 
different sources of data that would be interesting. Um, yeah, and another source of data that we can tap into is language instructions or narrations. Uh, so there is quite a bit of like offline data of language available like on internet, right? So if you can tap into that, that would be really interesting. Or if you could interactively teach a robot how to do a task using language, that would be very interesting. Um, and, and in general, I think this space of robo NLP um, has a lot of promise in this space and, and we, are, we are working in that direction too. So the thing I wanna spend a little bit more time maybe today briefly mentioning is this idea of learning from comparisons and rankings. So this is another source of data that doesn't require the person coming and providing a demonstration, right? Like it's not asking a person, hey, come and tell operate a demonstration here. Instead, what we are looking at is a robot just demonstrating a few demonstrate like a few trajectories and then asking a person, which one do you prefer or how would you rank them? And from that, we would like to learn ideally a reward function that represents the human preferences. And finally, the last category that I'm excited about that again, I'm not covering in this talk is this idea of physical corrections. So again, if you think about a robot, it's not an AI agent, right? Like it, it's not, it, it does have an embodiment and maybe we should like, again, tap into the fact that it has an embodiment, right? I can actually move the arm around and by moving the arm around, I can try to, I can try to learn from uh, that, that data of the person pushing, pushing the arm to the right or to the left. And then we're doing some work around this idea of learning from physical, physical corrections. But I, I wanna just very briefly talk about this idea of pairwise comparisons because that is a topic that, that we have been spending um, last couple of years on. And, and we've been looking at a variety of uh, challenges in that space. So, so the most generic form of this idea of learning from preferences is that I'm gonna show two different trajectories to a user, A and B, and then I'm gonna ask a user, well, which one do you prefer? And based on the human's response, I'm going to get some information about the underlying reward function. And let's assume that this underlying reward function is, is a linear combination of a set of features. The features could be nonlinear, but, but we are, we're assuming that the weights that we have here are these thetas that, that we'd like to learn. And we're assuming that the reward function here is a linear combination of set of features. Uh, we have some follow-up work at RSS last year, which actually captures the non-linear case where we have Gaussian processes. Uh, but for now, for a second, let's try to think about this reward function being a linear combination of, of uh, features. So um, for, as an example, imagine that this reward function, um, the, the thetas, the parameters of the reward function lie in a three-dimensional space. So theta one, theta two, and say theta three. Um, and then every question, every query that I would ask a user, like do you like trajectory A or trajectory B, is almost generating a separating hyperplane in this space. Uh, and picture is not showing up. But, but basically the human's response to that question is going to tell us which side of this hyperplane is preferred. Okay, so, so if the person tells me, hey, I like trajectory A over B, then, then that is basically saying, hey, I like a reward function that is on the right side of the hyperplane. And then in the vice versa case, like I, I like a reward function that is on the left of the, of the hyperplane. So then the interesting question here for us is what is the most informative, diverse sequence of questions, sequence of queries that I can ask a user to try to figure out what their reward function is? And, and this brings us to an active learning problem, right? Like this brings us to this idea of could we actively and adaptively generate new questions and new queries based on what the person told me like in the previous time step. And, and in general, that's a very well studied problem in a variety of fields. It brings its own challenges in the field of robotics, uh, but um, we could basically formulate this problem as, as follows. So we can basically say, hey, so I wanna figure out what is a question, what's a query that I can ask. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna use phi to correspond to that scenario. So this phi is the difference between feature vectors over trajectory A versus trajectory B. So, so this phi is going to fully represent the scenario that I show to the user, the two trajectories that I show to the user. So I'm, at, I'm maximizing using decision variable phi and then the objective I'm maximizing here is the minimum volume that would be removed from the hypothesis space. 
So, so here, like if you, if you remember this picture, you have a hypothesis space of all the places that this reward function could fall into. In this case, I'm assuming that I'm normalizing the reward function inside of the unit ball. So I'm assuming the reward function falls into this unit ball and I can sample from it using, using Metropolis Hastings or my favorite sampling method. Um, and then basically, um, based, like I, my, my question is, what is the next hyperplane? What is the next separating hyperplane that I should pick here? That, that based on the response I get from the human, I remove a lot of volume from this space. So I can quickly converge to the true reward function. And this is basically the subjective here, right? So minimum volume that would be removed is a minimum between if the person tells me they like A over B versus they like B over A. And that is basically what the subjective is encoding. And then we also have a constraint here. That constraint is capturing the fact that the scenario I'm generating, this V, has to actually satisfy dynamics. This is actually the robotics part of it that comes into play. So, so I need to make sure that these fees correspond to trajectories that are, that are actually satisfiable on the robot and satisfy dynamics and, and some of the constraints that we have there. Um, and then this is the single optimization. When I run the single optimization based on the result of this, I'm going to basically generate uh, a next question and query the person, get the response to that and continue doing this. One quick note is I'm not going to assume humans are perfect. So, so we actually have a human update function that reweighs the points based on a Boltzmann rational model of the person. So, so, so when we get a response from the human, we are not fully removing the wrong side. You're basically reweighing the samples based on the information we get from the person. And here is kind of like the most naive version of this algorithm where we have and we have no preferences. The car, which is our orange car, doesn't really know what to do. And then after 30 questions, the car learns how to keep heading, which is what it's doing in this case. And then after 70 questions, the car learns how to drive in this very simple driving simulator. But I would argue that that's actually pretty exciting because um, this is 70 binary questions, right? From 70 binary questions, we are able to actually capture driving in this simple simulator without any expert demonstrations, without any other sources of data. And, and I really think we should tap into this, this type of data. So since then, we have been looking at a variety of problems in the space of learning from pairwise comparisons. Um, very briefly, we have been looking at settings where the reward function cannot be captured with a, with a linear reward function. So in this case, like the reward function, uh, the way we are looking at it is modeling it uh, using a Gaussian process. So instead of having a linear reward, like we are looking at a Gaussian process that represents this reward function, and we are looking at a different task where we're looking at the robot playing a version of mini golf and trying to push the, push the ball here to any of these balls where the, the human teacher has a preference over a specific ball. So if you look at results of that, if we use a linear reward, it turns out that we end up like basically targeting the sides because using a linear reward, we end up ju just getting the boundaries and we are not able to even like represent like any of these other balls inside of here, uh, inside of this region. But using a Gaussian process reward, we are able to actually achieve this. Um, and active learning over Gaussian process rewards is a little bit more involved and has a bit of math in into it that I'm not discussing in this lecture and in, in this in this talk. All right. so. Yeah, so let me let me go back to here. So so that was very briefly thinking about the fact that humans leak information and there are many sources of data from humans. And maybe we should just be smarter about how we collect that data from humans. And, and that can help us learn reward functions or in general learn from interactions with humans. So that kind of brings us to the stable again, right? So, so we like using these ideas of active learning, like being smarter about what data we collect. Um, and, and one note on that, actually, like I use this volume removal objective, but you could use any other information theoretic metric, like in some of the other works we are looking at entropy or we are looking at uh, determinantal point processes as a measure of diversity. And you could use these different types of objectives and be a little bit smarter in terms of how you are querying the person and what type of data you're, you're getting from the person. And that helps us to be more data efficient when learning from humans. So in the last five minutes, I want to very briefly mention kind of an application of this idea of learning from humans, but also trying to learn representations as opposed to full on reward functions. And, and I'm going to look at this application in the setting of coordination. So not influencing people or any of that. Okay. 
And, and that application is something that um, in general, I'm very excited about. And that's, that's the application of assistive robotics and assistive teleoperation. So, so if you think about these assistive arms, right, they are, they're used for various types of tasks um, for, for and more than 1 million American users actually use them for getting outside of the bed, feeding yourself, like using the arm to move things around. And here's actually a video of a person using the arm. Let me play the video. So in this per case, the person is using this Jayco arm. It's a high degree freedom arm. So it has six degrees of freedom. And the thing I want you guys to notice is his hand. He keeps pushing the side. And what he's doing here is he's doing end effector control. So he's controlling the end effector of the robot. But that end effector has uh, six degrees of like six things to control, right? You can either control the linear mode, X, Y, Z of the end effector, or the angles, the yaw pitch roll. And that is why it's actually pretty difficult to control these robot arms, because you have to have this high degree freedom control space uh, to, to move things around. So an idea that we have been exploring over the past year um, here or so is, is basically the fact that maybe we could use similar ideas of learning representations to learn a low dimensional representation for these assistive arms. So these assistive arms are dexterous and this dexterity makes them useful, but it can also make them really hard to control. So something that we have been looking at is, could we learn a low dimensional representation that makes controlling these arms easier? And, and you might say, well, why do you think such a thing exists, right? Like in human-human interaction, I was arguing that humans are good at this and then they can figure out that low dimensional representation. Here, there is no interaction, right? There was a robot trying to do a task. Why do I think a low dimensional representation here exists for achieving, ach achieving a task? So there doesn't, right? Like for, for the most general case, if you wanna get the arm moved from some point in the state space to some other point in the state space, you do need all those degrees of freedom, right? There's a reason they exist, but, but conditioned on a task, I'd argue that there exists a lower dimensional representation. If you know a high degree freedom arm is moving on a sine wave, like if you know conditioned on that task, then there exists a one degree freedom controller that gets like the robot do that. You can just press plus one and the robot goes to the right and minus one and the robot goes to the left. So very briefly, we, have, we are training an autoencoder in a similar way here. In this case, we are looking at a reconstruction loss where we are looking at state and actions and beliefs and we are training an encoder and decoder. And in this case, we are decoding not a latent strategy, but a latent action uh, of the control that the person is putting in. Again, conditioned on the context and, and training this autoencoder is actually pretty interesting because when you are putting the loss function, in addition to reconstruction, there are a set of properties that, that are coming from control actually, that are pretty interesting and we should, we should incorporate them in order to have like at the end of the day, reconstruct, um, reconstruct an action and be able to learn a latent action that does the task right. And then these, these properties are things like reachability, controllability, temporal consistency, or even linearity. So, so we need to incorporate these priors in the loss function in order to ensure that you're learning a low dimensional representation that does the task right. So I think I'll have time to just like show you like how this works and practice. So um, on the left, you see end defector control, which is controlling six degrees of freedom. And this user is having a hard time like getting outside of this mode. But on the right, it's just much more smoother to move between the shelves and move things around. And this is a long horizon task where we are looking at making an apple pie. So at the end, the user is supposed to bring the apple and steer and everyone does their own weird way of steering. But it's again, like a lot faster, a lot more intuitive to use this idea of latent actions to control the arm as opposed to state of the art and effector control. All right, so since then, we've been looking at problems around assistive feeding. We actually have like a recent, just submitted this to RSS on Monday on trying to feed people and, and thinking about food acquisition, transfer of the food and thinking about, thinking about what forces even to put in to, to transfer the food inside of the person's mouth. And I think this is a very interesting robotics and interaction problem that is just not solved. Uh, like we don't have like good robots that can do this safely and comfortably. Uh, so I think it's a very exciting space to, to be in. All right, so, so with that, um, basically I've been talking about this idea of learning low dimensional representations and how that can be really useful for control and robotics. 
And then specifically how we can learn from humans and interact with humans using this low dimensional representation. But going back to this, to, to this uh, diagram, right? Like for the last like 20 minutes, I haven't said anything about non-stationarity and the fact that humans, humans can change. And I think we kind of like need like all of these, all of these together. And, and for the last maybe one minute, I want to talk a little bit about some of the future works that you're thinking about in this space. And that is specifically focused on this idea of non-stationarity and the fact that humans change, humans learn, um, and, and repeated interactions and some of the challenges that comes up there. And, and this is a problem that shows up in, in the setting of assistive robotics, right? So like, for example, if you have these exoskeletons, like one of the biggest problems in this space is over assistance where the robot is helping you out like all the time because it has a fixed model of you and it doesn't capture the fact that you're learning how to walk and you're using this for rehab. So, so the point of it is to actually let you learn how to walk. Um, and I think that requires like adaptive models of humans. Another space that this shows up is in the space of autonomous driving, right? Like I argued the fact that if you want to have interactive, like merging behaviors, you, you should cut in front of people and influence them. But that's again, a one step interaction, right? Like once you have influenced this person, this person might get really angry and try to like come back around and get ahead of you. And, and you haven't modeled any of that. And I, and I think it's interesting and important to model that um, one place that that shows up is when we have autonomous cars like on our roads and the fact that they change our behaviors, right? There are these vehicles like, uh, like all over San Francisco these days. And when you bike around them, they tend to like slow down and, and they tend to like get stuck at intersections. So people already have figured out like to change their behaviors. Like when I bike around these vehicles, I just go around them because I think they're probably stuck. And, and that's kind of interesting because yeah, my behavior has changed based on the few interactions I've had with this vehicle. And I'm giving wrong data to them too, which is also scary. But even beyond that, right? Like my behaviors has got influence and we should think about these repeated interactions and repeated influencing behaviors. And kind of like in a longer term scale, like larger scale, I think this is an important problem when we think about traffic, right? Like when we think about like large number of vehicles interacting with each other. And if you think about like driving in Tehran, which is where I grew up versus driving in Palo Alto, right? These two driving behaviors are very different from each other. And they kind of like both work okay, but there are different equilibria that, that these two systems have reached at. And, and it's, it's kind of interesting to think about how our actions can, can influence these equilibria and how we can guide these equilibria to end up in very different, different behaviors. And, and the reason I think it's imp important is we are going to see autonomous cars on roads, right? Like Waymo is putting out fleets of autonomous cars out. So, so we are seeing these types of effects. Um, and then one direction that you're, one other thread of work that you're looking at that I haven't talked about here is, uh, just generally mixed autonomy traffic, right? So how can we have uh, like a number of a fleet of autonomous cars? How can they affect things like routing and how can they affect things like traffic? So uh, yeah, with that, I would like to thank the group. It's the group during the COVID time. And I'd like to thank you guys and I can take any questions. Oh, thanks so much, Dalsa, for the talk. It's super interesting, yeah, and uh, proposing a lot of interesting ideas. So, like, uh, let's open up to the question now. And I have a question. So, regarding the third part about learning latent actions, could you elaborate or explain a little bit what you mean by incorporate some control properties like reachability, controllability into the loss function? Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that, uh, so... Um... I, I will not share a screen because that's going to take time. So I had like a bunch of hidden slides on that. But uh, basically what we were trying to do here is we, are, we have this autoencoder that is trying to bring the dimensionality of a six degree freedom control to like a two degree freedom control, which is like the latent action and, and what you're putting in on the joystick. And it turns out that if you just do reconstruction, like if you just optimize for reconstruction loss, you're going to get a low degree control, but it's not necessarily uh, going to have a set of properties that you might care about. For example, we had this idea of getting the arm move on a line with one degree freedom, right? And, and if I press right, maybe on the joystick, the arm would go to the right and maybe it goes to the right again. And then if I press the right, it, it's not necessarily going to the right because I never enforced that I want this to have like 
temporal consistency of like pressing right always means like going to the right. Sure, it has learned a low degree of freedom control space, but it hasn't learned some of these properties or like reachability, right? Like I want to be able to use this low degree freedom control to actually reach everywhere in my space. So we had actually four properties that we needed to encode as part of the loss function or ensure that the loss function kind of like enforces the, those, those four properties. And, and yeah, they are kind of like the usual properties you see in control. Got it, got it, thanks. And yeah, and uh, like uh, all the audience, feel free to unmute yourself and direct communicate with Dorsa. Hey Dorsa, uh, thank you so much for the great talk. Um, I have a question regarding the explainability and the causality of the learned latent representation. Because uh, from psychology, we know that like uh, the behavior sense, like uh, like uh, my in intent could be overfitted, right? I didn't actually mean that, but it could be overfitted. So mm -hmm. could you comment on like, how do we know the learned representation is kind of a minimum? Didn't like over uh, overfit my behavior, uh, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a very interesting question. And I don't have like too good of a convincing answer for it because I actually like, I think that's an important question. So in our case, uh, like we had some simple, like even like the air hockey example that I was showing, it was like learning a very simple representation, which was the latent strategy of the other agent. Are you pushing to the right, left or middle? And, and um, because it was a very simple setting, it was fairly easy to learn the representations that are actually like meaningful and are explainable, but just more generally, like, like are, what, what is this representation? Like what is an explanation for it? Uh, we don't have like good ways of assessing that. Um, and in terms of, uh, so we have like another work where we are looking at building like a block structure, like two agents coming together, trying to like build a block structure together. Uh, and in that case, we are also like trying to enforce minimality of the representation. Uh, but the way we are like training this, 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 this network in that case is a very modular approach where we train it with multiple partners. And, and the idea is if, if you have, like we separate out what is about the partner and what is about the task. And that could be like also like one way of trying to address and ensure we're not overfitting to like a specific way a specific partner is doing it. So I think a more modular approaches could help in this space. And, and that, that was kind of like the approach we used in the blocks, uh, block uh, placing. But yeah, looking at the representation, even in that work, like it doesn't have too much like explanation or meaning. And that's definitely something we're looking at. Yeah, how can we follow up in the hockey like the scenario? I, I think the lady idea is quite interesting. Like we learn the representation and then we use the representation as part of our policy input along with the state, right? So like, but I uh, where I don't really understand is the lady with influence part. Like where does the influence part show up in the, in the mm -hmm. since the goal is like maximize the expected reward of RL, how does the influence part come mm -hmm. Yeah, so the influence part only shows up in the reward function. So, mm -hmm. so in the normal setting, right, like as you said, like there is a representation and there is the RL part, the RL part has a reward function. Yeah. And that reward function is over like, a, like one interaction. Oh. But if you make that reward function to care about over multiple interactions, right, like mm -hmm. more long term reward, it is going to take a little bit longer for it to learn but it is also going to be able to actually like influence the other agent and like kind of like realize that for more this long-term thing of the robot getting more reward if it goes to the left, it should, it should kind of like influence the other agent. Um, one other thing we are looking at at the moment is you could play around with that reward function quite a bit. You could actually make that reward function stabilize the other agent, right? So, so maybe stabilizing the other agent um, could help with non-stationarity. So I think that could be like another interesting way of using the framework, but again, modifying the report function for, for a learning goal, which is I stabilize the other agent and I don't have as much non-stationarity. So I learn better. I see, got it. So, so basically Lily only incorporate the representation in the policy part, but like when we consider influence, we also incorporate that representation in the reward part, capturing the interaction. We reward. modify the reward. Yeah, we modify the reward so it is over across interactions as opposed to over got a single it. interaction. Got it. Yeah, that's super interesting. Cool. And uh, so, Oh, yes. Yeah. So uh, there is a question posed in the chat by uh, Habib. So yeah. he asked if Fort, if Fort diagnoses your concern in this kind of project. 
I don't mean no yeah, one. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, question. Uh, not, uh, yeah, in these works, we are mainly trying to, yeah, not, not in these works. We have like a, a bunch of other work where we are looking at diagnosing failures and repairing them, which I think is also a very interesting question, especially when we are interacting with people. Um, yeah, so uh, not in any of these works, but like, for example, you could, if you learn that representation and if you have like a model of that, if, if the person deviates from that, that could be a way of trying to do like fault analysis in, in this case, but yeah. Um, I can read the question. Should I, should I read the question? Yeah, yeah, sounds good. Okay, so have you considered using strategies from the field of information retrieval to learn a reward function, for example, rank uh, SVM? If so, could you tell, uh, tell us why you have chosen Gaussian process over these strategies? Uh, so so for the, this is for the active learning part, I'd imagine. So for the active learning part, yeah, so the reason we use Gaussian processes uh, in, in that case was um, there are, uh, it's, it's more scalable to actually learn, um, learn the reward function in that case. Uh, so, so you could actually do active learning on it. Uh, from like, like you could actually, you have a bunch of parameters that you can actually do active learning over. And then uh, there is, uh, it's easier to play around with priors and posterior. So like we need to ensure that our posterior also like has like a good form. Um, we haven't looked at these information retrieval ideas, uh, but that would be interesting to look at. We have a recent work where we are trying to learn from rankings and learn a multimodal reward function. So this was actually just also a submission to RSS. Uh, so instead of learning a single reward function, we are learning a multimodal reward function, and we are looking at like ideas from learning from rankings and mixture models. So uh, I think that could be similar to some of the ideas you were thinking. Um, do you know if this approach is being used for other forms of adaptive user interfaces? Um, uh, we are in conversation with other folks on like trying to use some of these approaches in other settings, but I haven't really seen it in other forms of user interfaces. Uh, in the Lilly experiments, is the policy of the other agent fixed? Yes, the policy of the other agent in this case is fixed. What would happen if other agent also evolves? That's a very good question. So we need to have like an evolving latent strategy. And that's something that we are currently looking at. We have also, we need to have maybe like a more expressive representation of the policy. So over a longer period of time. So for example, we have looked at more complex policies where we are looking at a history of interaction as opposed to like the just one step interaction. Uh, like when the policy just depend of the other agent depends on the history. And, and we are able to handle that too. Um, using parse tree, uh, par uh, so will using parse trees, part whole hierarchies help to modularize, to prevent overfitting. Uh, yeah, that's that's also a good idea. Um, yeah, the the modular approach I was talking about is an Eichler paper where we are separating out learning two separate networks, but more adding more structure like parse trees could also be useful in that setting. Something we haven't looked at. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, I guess that's all the questions. And thanks again. Let's thanks again for our